Your Excellency, uh, good evening to you all. My name is Christoph Paulsen, and I'm a senior researcher in international humanitarian law and international criminal law here at the TMC Osler Institute. I wish to welcome everybody to the uh, second supranational criminal law lecture in the season 2013-2014. The supranational criminal law lecture series is a lecture series on international criminal law and has been organized on an almost weekly basis since uh, 2003 uh, in cooperation with the Grote Center for International Legal Studies of Leiden University and the Coalition for the ICC. Tonight's speaker is uh, Donald Ferenc. He's a visiting professor at Middlesex University School of Law in London. He's convener of the Global Institute for the Prevention of Aggression and director of the Planetude Foundation, which was established in 1996 by Donald and his father Benjamin Ferenc. And their goal is to help um, educate toward replacing the law of force with the force of law. Professor Friends will address the history and current status of the crime of aggression before the ICC and will also explain to us who is actually fooling whom in the context of this crime. Professor Friends, many thanks for being on our lecture series. Um, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Is this on? There's a little red light on. You see? I'll make it green. Green. Oh, yeah, red is very, very good. Uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction. I'm absolutely delighted to be here and delighted to see so many of you here. I'm actually quite amazed. I didn't really expect on a cold night to see such a turnout. So that's why I told Christophe we better get started and move things along here. I'm also delighted. To, uh, I received a very nice email yesterday from a very distinguished jurist, Judge Hans Peter Kahl, who's sitting in the front row, telling me that he would be here. And uh, he has already informed me that he's going to keep me honest tonight. By the end of my talk, he may tell people that he actually doesn't know me. So I want to leave that open as a possibility. Um, I can see from looking that it's a bit of a mixed group. I know we have some diplomats in the room. We have some people who work in tribunals. We have students. And so what I would like to do is, um, in the space of about maybe 35 minutes or so, maybe roughly, tell you a little bit about who I am and how I got here, what my interest and involvement has been relative to the crime of aggression, uh, give you a little bit of historical background starting at the beginning, uh, and try to bring you current. And if at any point anyone in the audience would like to say something, either they have a question or they have an objection, uh, feel free. I'd like this to be sort of an open discussion. So I'm Don Ferenz. I'm an American citizen. I was born in Nuremberg, where my father had previously been a chief prosecutor at the age of 27 of a case called the Einsatzgruppen case, which was one of the trials put on by the Americans after the International Military Tribunal by the Four Powers. And uh, he had some um, unusual luck, actually, in becoming a chief prosecutor at the age of 27, because they had discovered the cache of documents of these German death squads, the Einsatzgruppen, who were responsible for killing well over a million innocent civilians. And these were presented to my dad, so he went to Telford Taylor, said we have to put on a trial. Taylor said we can't do it, everything's already allocated, everything's already budgeted, can you do it on top of your other, du other duties? And my father, being a clever guy at the age of 27, said yes. And so he became, at that age, the prosecutor in what was billed at the time as the biggest murder trial in history. And um, you can see actually clips of his opening statement on the internet today, but one of the things that he said, which has stuck with me, is the case we present is a plea of humanity to law. And that's really what I'd like to talk about. The title of our talk tonight is The Crime of Aggression. I wanted to say who's fooling who, but my English was improved for tonight, so it's grammatical. But I also sent Christoph, and I think you might be interested to know, a list of other potential titles. And I'm going to read you some of the potential <laughs> list of titles. And then I'm going to explain you know, as we progress. Aggression and the ICC. The P5 versus the rest of the world? Question mark. Um, does the crime of aggression deserve to be activated before the ICC? Robert Jackson who I'm going to talk about in a few minutes, the US chief prosecutor at the IMT. Robert Jackson, The Crime of Aggression, A Visionary or a Fool? These are among the titles. I won't read all of them. 
And the reason that I have this edge in the titles is the crime of aggression, as you will hear, is a crime about which the international community, if there is such a thing, has been rather ambivalent. I'd like to start at the very beginning, but before I start at the beginning, I want to tell you a very quick personal story. Before I went to law school, got an MBA, became an executive, and then got involved in international justice, I was an elementary school teacher, and I taught a kindergarten class, and I want to tell you an important story for any of you engaged in the uh, education field. There was a little boy in the class who couldn't learn his letters. His name was Curtis. Every other child is happily singing the letters of the alphabet, but not Curtis. So what did I do? I took a bunch of little yellow cards, and I made the letters of the alphabet, and I'm flipping them in front of him, and every single one he's getting wrong. And when I came to the end, I had some blank yellow cards in my hand. And in a moment of real inspiration, I flipped him the next card, blank card, and he kept saying the names of letters with blank cards in front of him. And the reason I tell you this story is this. I looked at the kid and I realized this child didn't know his letters because nobody ever explained to him what is the concept of a letter. I said they have names, just like all the kids in the class. And I tell you this story because so often we hear lectures where people don't start at the beginning. So I say something, you don't know what I'm talking about, please feel, feel free to interrupt. I'm going to go all the way back to the Code of Hammurabi. Some of you have probably heard about him. Ancient Babylonian king, lived about 2,000 years before Christ. And he wasn't the mo most modest of kings, but he put together a rock, a stele, a little obelisk, with his code on it. The code is a rather arcane code, but it has a preamble, which has words in it that are worth repeating. He starts off by saying, I, Hammurabi, have been appointed by the gods to rule over the land and bring righteousness. And then he talks about why is he giving the law. And it's words that echo at Nuremberg, and I'll echo them again here tonight. He says, yeah, I'm giving this law so that the powerful shall not oppress the weak. So we have, going back 2,000 years before Christ, Code of Hammurabi, law as an equalizer, among people in different positions of power. I'll come back to it when we talk about Robert Jackson. I like to pay tribute during the course of these little talks to various points of light along the way. Not a particular point of light, but somebody I'll mention is Thucydides, who had a few words to say about power and law. He said, the powerful do what they can and the weak endure what they must. Thucydides was the historian for the Peloponnesian Wars. Whenever I mention him, I jump ahead a few thousand years to the portico over the United States Supreme Court. It has four words etched in the portico. Equal justice under law. Law as the equalizer among people. Before I get into Nuremberg, I quickly want to pay tribute to Emmerich de Vattel, a Swiss jurist who probably many of you have read about or heard about in your studies. He wrote a book which translated into English called, is called The Law of Nations in 1758. And in his Law of Nations in 1758, 200 years before Nuremberg, more or less, he wrote that the sovereign who takes his nation into an unjust war is guilty of a crime. And he uses the word crime quite pointedly, a crime against his own nation a crime against the nation that he attacks, and he goes on to say, finally, he is guilty of a crime against mankind in general, whose peace he disturbs, and to whom he sets a pernicious example. This is 200 years before Nuremberg. Now we come to Nuremberg. <clears throat> At Nuremberg, we had something called crimes against peace and conspiracy to commit crimes against peace. That was the jargon that was being used. It's ironic because it echoes actually the very phrasing that was in the text by Emmerich de Vattel. Before I leave de Vattel, I'll tell you another little anecdotal story. I happen to know that while George Washington was sitting as president of the United States, he went to the library next to his offices in New York and he took out de Vattel's Law of Nations. In fact, it was October 17, I think, 1780-ish, something like that. And the reason I know about it is because his estate finally returned the book 221 years later, and it made the news. So this was something that was being read around the time of the American Revolution as well. Nuremberg, 
we have Robert Jackson. Now, probably all of you will know that war crimes were prosecuted in Nuremberg, crimes against humanity, which were at the IMT, the International Military Tribunal, were prosecutable to the extent that they occurred during an international armed conflict. And we also had crimes against peace, or waging aggressive war, war in violation of international treaties and assurances. When Robert Jackson took the podium on the opening day of statements, he said words that to me echo what we just heard about Hammurabi. He said that four great nations, flushed with victory and stung with injury, stay the hand of vengeance and voluntarily submit their captive enemies to the judgment of the law is one of the most significant tributes that power has ever paid to reason. Power in deference to, to reason. And I mention it because this was the view that Robert Jackson had of the true legacy and the meaning of Nuremberg. Some of you will know that in December 1946, in its first sessions, the General Assembly adopted the Nuremberg Principles, the principles of the Nuremberg Charter, and called immediately for the codification of international law and ultimately the establishment of an international criminal court. Before I leave Nuremberg, I want to take you back a little bit to the interwar years between World War I and II. Probably many of you have heard of the Kellogg-Briand Pact. This was a multilateral treaty initiated by the French, who first wanted a bilateral arrangement with the United States. It was a treaty for the renunciation of war as an instrument of national policy. <clears throat> it was officially, originally signed up to in 1928. Many countries ratified it. And I want to tell you a little bit about some a little interesting historical anecdote about the Kellogg-Briand Pact which I think has resonance with what I'm going to tell you about what Jackson said after Nuremberg. When the treaty came up for a vote in the United States Senate, it was overwhelmingly ratified by a vote of 85 in favor and only one opposed. And when I read that statistic, I thought, there's got to be a story here. Who would be so crazy as to vote against the treaty for the renunciation of war? And what, it, what I discovered was that it was voted against by John James Blaine, a Republican senator from Wisconsin, who stood up on the floor of the US Senate, and it's in the congressional record from January 9th, 1929. So you can go look it up. And he knew some things about the Kellogg-Briand Pact. He knew it was a lovely statement renouncing war. He knew it had no provision for sanctions. He also knew that the British had undertaken these special understandings or reservations, they then called them declarations, where they said, we're signing on to this treaty, okay, but we reserve for ourselves the right in our, to make a determination in our sole discretion, our own discretion, of when our interests require defense by force of arms. And so Blaine looked at this treaty and he said on the floor of the Senate, this treaty doesn't mean what it says, he called it a sham, and he went further. He said, the treaty, and this is a quote, weighted down by the reservations, contains the fertile soil for all the wars of the future. So it's quite an interesting story that the one person who voted against Kellogg-Briand voted against it for what per, were perhaps the correct reasons. Some of you may know that in the interwar period in the United States, there was an extremely active peace movement and in fact, I just in the last weeks have been reading something by someone by the name of Salman O. Levinson, who in 1921 wrote a pamphlet on the outlawry of war. And uh, this was really a hotbed of activity in the US, and so it was politically, how shall I say, if not expedient, acceptable for the US Congress to vote in favor of outlawing war. And oh, by the way, the United States also retained for itself these reservations which were alluded to, and of course, Blaine knew about that as well. At Nuremberg, <clears throat> in the second paragraph of Jackson's opening statement, he said, he said words that are quoted often, and I want to quote them again to you. 
He said the common sense of mankind demands that the law not stop with the punishment of petty crimes by little people. It must also reach men who possess themselves of great power and make deliberate and concerted use of it to set in motion, to set in motion evils which leave no home in the world untouched. And I emphasize that because for Jackson, Nuremberg was not about prosecuting war crimes or crimes against humanity. It was about looking at those who initiated and instigated the wars. It wasn't necessarily about going after the people with the pistols. It was going after the people with the fountain pens as well. At the end of the Nuremberg trials, <clears throat> a few weeks before the United Nations adopted the principles of Nuremberg, Jackson wrote a letter to President Truman. And I happen to have it highlighted. And what he said was very interesting. He was reporting on what the trials meant to the President of the United States. He said, no one can hereafter deny or fail to know that the principles on which the Nazi leaders are adjudged to forfeit their lives constitutes law and law with a sanction. Remember, Kellogg Briand had no sanction. There was a big discussion at Nuremberg. Is this ex post facto law? Is it even a crime to take a nation into war? Jackson knew that this debate had gone on. There was a question about was going to war a sanctionable offense? And here he's writing right after the trials, and he says no one can pretend not to know after these trials that this is law and law with a sanction. He went on in the same letter to say, these standards by which the Germans have been condemned will become the condemnation of any nation that is faithless to them. He wasn't just writing to Harry Truman. He was writing to the world. This was, as far as Jackson was concerned, the true legacy of Nuremberg, taking the world forward and saying that beginning an illegal war is a crime for which you will be individually held to account. Now, when Jackson said to Truman, no one can hereafter deny or fail to know that this constitutes law and law with a sanction, I step back today and I ask the question, who's kidding who? Was Jackson exaggerating? He was talking to the President of the United States. He was telling him what the import of the Nuremberg trials was. Is it, was it law? and law with a sanction when he wrote that letter. Well, it had been, it had been at the IMT. And the question is, was it really law with a future sanction or a future potential sanction? And I would say that, in fact, it is not law with a sanction on an ongoing and regularized basis even today. So we jump forward. Big effort to try to push for the International Criminal Court. All of that was stymied during the Cold War. We come to 1998, the Conference of Rome. The Conference of Rome says there'll be an international criminal court <clears throat> based on a system of what we refer to as complementarity, meaning it is complementary to national courts. It will have jurisdiction only over four serious crimes of grave concern to the international community. Genocide, war crimes, crimes against humanity, and the crime of aggression. But in Rome in 1998, this was a very contentious question could the court take jurisdiction over the crime of aggression? Some of you will know that Article 39 of the United Nations Charter says that the United, uh, the United Nations Security Council shall determine the existence of acts of aggression. And so the permanent members of the Security Council have uniformly taken the position, and they take the position today, that it should be the Security Council that really controls any forward movement on the crime of aggression. In Rome, in 1998, they said, although the court has jurisdiction over the crime of aggression, it may not exercise that jurisdiction until such time as a definition is adopted in the Rome Statute and provisions are adopted setting forth the manner in which the court may exercise its jurisdiction. 
In the summer of 2010, after a number of years of working on this, there was a big review conference in Kampala, Uganda. Now, I happened to be privileged to be working with what was called the Working Group on the Crime of Aggression, a subgroup of the International Criminal Court, which was working to develop proposals for the crime of aggression. We came into Kampala. A definition of the crime of aggression has now been adopted, and it is in the statute. The more contentious issues about the crime of aggression is the question of whether the court can independently exercise its jurisdiction. And the answer is this. The regime that was adopted in resolution form, which has yet, by the way, to be activated, I'll say more about this. The regime specifies that the Security Council can refer a case on aggression to the ICC, and if it does, the ICC effectively has jurisdiction over the whole world. But if the Security Council does not refer a case, if it's propria motu or state referral, then the court will only have jurisdiction over countries and nationals of countries which have not opted out of the court's jurisdiction other than, other than nationals of countries which are not members of the Assembly of States parties. So let me rephrase it. If you are not a member of the Assembly of States parties, and you are a national of such a country, you cannot be touched by the crime of aggression, even if your country wants to voluntarily consent to such jurisdiction. Uh, just by way of a very quick technical aside, for those of you may, who may be technicians, there's a provision in the Rome Statute that says that if you are not a member of the Assembly of States parties, but you want to voluntarily uh, allow the court to assert jurisdiction, you may do so by a declaration, not as to the crime of aggression. The crime of aggression will not apply to non-states parties. So we have a totally voluntary consent-based regime in a case other than a Security Council referral. Countries can opt out, uh, and we don't know whether countries will opt out or not. I'd like to say just a little bit more about um, some of the reaction that I have seen myself, some of it here in The Hague. I've attended meetings where the United States government has had representatives who have stood up and made some very interesting comments. One of them was a comment made by a senior person in the State Department who said, you know, one thing countries may want to do relative to the ratification of these amendments, and I'll say more about that in a moment, one of the things countries may want to consider doing is to only ratify that portion of the amendments that gives the Security Council the right to refer a case. And I mention it in particular because there may be more that is said about that by those who, in fact, do not want to see the court exercise independent jurisdiction. When I heard that comment, I went back through the magic of the Internet, and I went to a, an interesting place, the American Society of International Law website, had a briefing put on by some of the very senior people in the United States State Department immediately after Kampala, literally the same week. And they said emphatically that everything that happened in Kampala, the amendments and the understandings that were coupled together with them, were all part and parcel of one indivisible unified package. I mention that only because I immediately typed it up into my computer, because this was a, you know, a spoken text, and I thought, well, I'll wait until the U.S. State Department once again tries to bifurcate these and remind them that after Kampala it was they who said that we all must keep in mind it was one unified package, which it was, by the way, because nobody uh, in Kampala was happy with the idea of the Security Council alone having jurisdiction over this crime. Now, <clears throat> the resolutions adopted in Kampala require that before they can become effective as to anybody, at least 30 separate states' parties must ratify them. This is new. This was not a provision that existed before Kampala. This is something that was concocted in Kampala as part of what you may hear, hear referred to as the Kampala Compromise. So 30 countries need to ratify this before it will become effective as to anyone. And the entire Assembly of States parties needs to reapprove these provisions by no sooner than the 1st of January 2017 before they can become effective as to anyone. 
So these were provisions that were put in in Kampala. Now, I want to just share one other little thought with you. I had a private conversation with somebody at the State Department about two or three years ago, and I said, you know, you may remember, some of you will know the O.J. Simpson case in the United States, where a professional athlete, former athlete, killed his wife and her lover. And uh, at, uh, when the trial came, I remember talking to my father. First day of the trial, he said, he's guilty. I said, Dad, how can you say that guy's guilty? The trial's just starting. He said, he's guilty. I said, well, how do you know? He said, it's obvious he's guilty. Because when your client is guilty, you try to exclude evidence. When your client is innocent, your strategy is to bring in as much evidence as you can. He said, this, the strategy of this team is to exclude evidence. And the reason I brought that up in my conversation with the U.S. State Department, I said, guys, if you look like you're obstructionist with respect to the crime of aggression, you look like you're guilty of committing the crime of aggression. <laughs> because who else would be afraid of criminalizing the improper and illegal use of force? Now, <clears throat> aggression, as far as the ICC is concerned, is in legal limbo today. It won't come out of that limbo any time before 2017. But at least 10 or 11 countries have already ratified, and I brought a list, I don't want to forget to read it, just so you'll know who's taking the lead on this. Liechtenstein, Samoa, Trinidad and Tobago, Luxembourg, Estonia, Germany, thanks in part to the very robust efforts of Judge Hans-Peter Kahl, to whom we all owe a debt of gratitude on this, Botswana, Cyprus, Slovenia, Uruguay, and Andorra. There are at least another 15 countries that are in the pipeline. Will we get to 30 ratifications? I would be very surprised if we did not get to 30 ratifications. At the end of the day, do we have law and law with a sanction? Well, the ICC doesn't have boots on the ground. It's completely reliant on the cooperation of states. We've seen recently where when the heat gets turned on, where that cooperation goes out the window. But we do have people like us in this room. We see the, what some people refer to as the Arab Spring. We see people communicating. We see people saying, we've had enough. Even Dwight Eisenhower um, was quoted as having said, while President of the United States, he said, I think people want peace so badly that one of these days, governments are going to have to get out of their way and let them have it. So that's a little snapshot of where we are. And I've talked for about 28 minutes or so. I, I'd like to leave you with uh, another quote. And then I'd like to open it up for discussion, questions, reactions, comments. And it's a quote that I find very chilling. And I, I, I quote it a lot. It's also a quote from Nuremberg. And for me, as an American who watched my country undertake a military incursion in Iraq based on supposed weapons of mass destruction that never quite materialized, I really take these words to heart. Hermann Goering was interviewed in his jail cell. You'll recall he was a Reich Marshal. At one point, he was Hitler's number two man. He didn't feel it was dignified to die by a hangman's noose. He wanted to die by his own hand. And in fact, he was quoted at one point as saying he wanted to die like the great General Hannibal, who took his own life. And he did. He took a cyanide capsule just a few hours before he was to be hung. But from his jail cell, he said words that I find very realistic. He said, naturally, the common people don't want war, neither in Russia, nor in England, nor for that matter in Germany. That is understood. But after all, it is the leaders of the country who determine the policy. And it is always a simple matter to drag the people along. Whether it is a democracy or a fascist dictatorship or a parliament or communist dictatorship, voice or no voice, the people can always be brought to the bidding of the leaders. That is easy. All you have to do is tell them they're being attacked and denounce the peacemakers for lack of patriotism and exposing the country to danger. It works the same in any country. And that's why I think we need laws criminalizing illegal use of force. Thank you.